So tonight we're going to continue our look at Nehemiah and how this book uh, talks about unity within the Christian body, within the body of Christ. Last week we talked about our calling, what God wants us to do, and how that relates to the collective calling, what He wants everybody to do as far as building his kingdom. So tonight, in this same series uh, that I'm calling Christian Unity, we're looking at another subject, uh, leadership. So tonight, next Wednesday, and the next Wednesday, so three Wednesdays in a row, we will be looking at various levels of leadership that we see here in Nehemiah. Tonight, we're starting with senior leadership. So, admittedly, I had completely overlooked the fact that October is National Pastor Appreciation Month. So, um, I would like to honor our pastors, Rod and Nathan, and just say thank you for everything that you guys do for the church. Thank you for leading us and keeping us in line uh, as best as you can. Uh, in 1 Timothy 5, 17, it says, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. So to me, this month goes to all of the elders, and I would like to honor all of our elders along with our pastors and say thank you. Thank you for all of us. So now, uh, we'll get to the message. So, Nehemiah chapter 10 it says, All the seals are the names of Nehemiah the governor, the son of Hekeliah, Zedekiah, Sarah, Azariah, Jeremiah, Peshur, Amorah, Malchajah, Hadish, Shebaniah, Malak, Harim, Meribaoth, Obadiah, Daniel, Ginnathon, Barak, Meshul, Abijah, Midjamin, Maziah, Belgah, Shemaiah. These are the priests and the Levites, Jeshua, the son of Azaniah, Benui, of the sons of Hinnadad, Cadmiel, and their brothers, Shebaniah, Hodiah, Kelita, Peliah, Hanan, Mika, Rehob, Hashabiah, Zechor, Sherebiah, Shebaniah, Hodiah, Bani, Benanu, the chiefs of the people, Parash, Pahath Moab, Elam, Zatu, Bani, Buni, Asgad, Bebai, Adonijah, Bigvi, Adin, Adar, Hezekiah, Azor, Hodiah, Hashem, Bizei, Harif, Anathoth, Nebai, Magpesh, Meshala, Hazir, Mesh, Isabel, Zadok, Jaduel, Pelatiah, Hanan, Ananiah, Hoshea, Hananiah, Hashub, Halohesh, Pilha, Shobek, Hashub, Halohesh, Pilha, Shobek, I think I read that one twice, sorry. Rehom, Hashbana, Mesana, Aha, Hanan, Anan, Malak, Haram, and Bana. Another big list of names. Uh, but now it says, the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who separated themselves from the people of the lands to the laws of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding, join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, our Lord, and His rules and His statutes. We will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land, or take their daughters for our sons, 
And if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. And we will forego the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. We also take ourselves the obligation to give yearly the third part of the shekel for the service of the house of God. For the showbread, the regular grain offering, the regular burnt offering, the Sabbath, the new moons, the appointed feasts, the holy things, and the sin offering to make atonement for Israel and for all the works of the house of our God. We, the priests, the Levites, and the people have likewise cast lots for the wood offering to bring it into the house of our God according to our father's houses at the time appointed year by year to burn on the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law. We obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of every tree year by year to the house of the Lord. Also, to bring to the house of God to the priests who minister in the house of our God the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle as it is written in the law and the firstborn of our herds and of our flocks, and to bring the first of our dough and our contributions, the first, the fruit, excuse me, of every tree, the wine and the oil to the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God, and to bring to the Levites the tithes from our ground. For it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all of our towns where we labor. And the priests, the sons of Aaron, shall be with the Levites, when the Levites receive the tithes, and the Levites shall bring up the tithes to the tithes of the, to the house of our God, to the chamber of the storehouse. For the people of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of grain, wine, and oil to the chambers, where the vessels of the sanctuary are, as well as the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers. We will not neglect the house of our God. So, a lot to unpack here. The first 27 verses, we see where all the senior leadership is named. Because it goes to the priests and the heads of houses that all came together to make this covenant. They skimmed back through the law, they dug and dug and dug, and saw all that they needed to do, and they all came together in unity to make this covenant. In the rest of the chapter, you see where it's talking about what the covenant was, what the terms were. And if you go back and look at a lot of this, the different sacrifices, the different burnt offerings, things like that, were all named in the law for what needed to be done. So they were getting all this from the law, combining it, all agreeing to it, and we'll see later where they communicated this to everyone else so that everyone else knew exactly what they were getting into. But for tonight, which we're going to be looking specifically at this senior leadership team. In 1 Timothy, Paul gives a list of qualifications or qualities, if you will, of what a senior leader needs to have in the church. And that's in verse, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. It says, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit 
and fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. It's quite the list. That list is almost identical. You could say it's practically identical, maybe slightly different wording to the list that Paul gives us in Titus. And that's in chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. It says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must first, or he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So both of these lists are pretty much identical. Slightly different wording, same qualifications. Instead of looking at these, though, I want to look at some that didn't make the list, but are just as important that we see elsewhere. So in 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 5, it says, So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders, clothe yourselves, all of you with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So Paul, or excuse me, Peter, is addressing all the elders. Paul was telling Timothy and Titus what to look for so that he could appoint elders. In Acts 20, 28, this is Paul on his way back to Jerusalem speaking to the elders in Ephesus. He says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. So again, we see Paul and Peter talking to elders and telling all the elders to shepherd the flock, not just the pastors. So we can take from these two that senior leadership team includes elders, pastors, any kind of preachers, anybody who is seasoned in the faith is willing to lead, not under compulsion, and they eagerly want to lead. And we'll look at those two a little bit, a little bit closer here in just a second. But both of these examples tell the elders to pay attention to the flock. So it's not just show up on Sunday, go home. Pay attention. What does the flock need? What does the flock want? How, how are they acting? What can you read from body language? What do you hear them praying about? Things like that. Pay attention. Because sometimes God wants us to act instead of waiting on Him. So He may allow us to see people act in a certain way or hear their prayers and hear them talking about wanting something to happen in the church. 
And then it may be up to leadership to step out in faith and start to do the best that they can to provide that and trust that the Lord will provide the rest that, that we as humans can provide. And shepherd, shepherding, in both versions of that, are it's a verb. So it indicates that an action is taking place. Being a shepherd is not a passive role. It's not something that once we obtain that position, that we can just sit back and go, well, I'm on top now, so y'all y'all have fun out there. It, it's an active participatory role. You must be able to lovingly and courageously rebuke when needed. So if you notice that something isn't right, you have to have the courage to fix it. And I told you we would talk about eagerly and willingly. So eagerly is used to emphasize a strong desire to do or to have something. So if you're eagerly taking on the responsibilities of a senior leadership, you have a desire to do that. You have a desire to help your flock, to shepherd your flock, to guide them in the right direction. Willingly means readily or of one's own free will. So it's not something that you do just because nobody else is doing it. It's not something you do because you feel like you have to. It's something you should do because you want to. Both say to be an example. So John 13, 15, Jesus said, I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. So Jesus is our ultimate example to follow. It's who we are all trying to be like. And we see in Nehemiah, these leaders were trying to be an example. They came together, unified over God's word, which at that time was the law. They agreed to follow it, and they set that example for everyone else. And they started talking about uh, all the different burnt offerings and tithing and everything that they agreed to, which was exactly in line with God's word, being the example for everyone else. So that when they sat them down to talk to them, they could tell them exactly what it entailed, what it involved. We also see Paul mentioned in Romans, uh, weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. So leadership, senior leadership, should be there with, for everyone. Should have that presence whenever someone needs it. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be with every person in the congregation 24-7. That's practically impossible. But if you know someone's having a hard time, they're going through a rough season in life, the senior leadership should be the first ones in line to pray with that person, to be with that person, setting that example for the rest of the congregation to follow. That leads into showing people how to live in God's will. So the last sermon we touched on obedience of faith from Romans 1 verse 5. And I asked the question, does your obedience or is your obedience in proportion with the faith that you claim to have? I can't tell you if you're being obedient because I don't know what God has told you to do. But I do know when any of us are being obedient, we produce the fruits of the Spirit. So when I see someone producing the fruits of the Spirit, I know they're being obedient, at least to that one particular thing. 
Now, there may be a lot of other that they're being disobedient to, but to that one piece, they're being obedient. And just remember, actions speak louder than words. We can get up here, we can tell people what to do all day long. But it means a lot more to them when they see us doing it. So how do you let everyone see you as the example? Now, there is one particular quality or qualification, if you will, from the Timothy and the Titus examples that I want to touch on for just a minute because it is exclusive to the senior leadership. The junior leadership qualifications that Paul gives Timothy does not include this particular one. So this qualification is senior leaders must be able to teach. And we see that in 1 Timothy 3, 2. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. In Titus, he tells Titus the same thing. So in Titus 1, 9, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction or teach in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So senior leadership, in some form or fashion, should be able to explain God's Word to anybody who has a question. It doesn't mean that everyone should be able to get up here and preach. So I just want to make that clear. I'm not saying that all senior leadership should be preachers. But if someone from the congregation has a question, they should be able to go to any senior leader, any elder, and they should be able to explain it to them. In Acts 6, 4, it says, But we will devote ourselves, ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word, the teaching of the Word. All senior leaders need to be able to teach. If senior leaders aren't teaching, even though the Word says that they should be able to teach. If they're not teaching, then they are still teaching. They're just teaching that we don't have to follow the Word because the Word says they should be able to teach. And the example there in Acts are, that was uh, when the twelve were being overburdened, really. They were trying to keep up with prayer and their ministry, and they were being overburdened with feeding the poor, taking care of all that. So that's when the first New Testament official junior leadership team was set up. And we'll look at that a little closer next week. But you see in Nehemiah, what, from verses 28 on, that was everything that they were going to teach everyone else. That was what they took from the law and said, this is what we have to follow, and this is what we're going to teach everybody else. And senior leadership should have a clear vision for the people that they lead. So again, starting in Nehemiah 28, it says the rest of the people. So what they were talking about, about here, all the different laws to follow. That was their vision. Follow the laws that Moses wrote. Senior leadership needs to communicate that clearly. So these days, we might well call that a mission statement. I'm sure we've all heard that particular thing thrown around. I think me personally, I think we have a good one on our side out there, knowing God and making Him known. But also, part of that mission statement is how do we execute on it? What's our plan? How are we actually fulfilling our mission statement? Also, 
once I, we don't necessarily see it in this particular passage of Nehemiah directly. We don't see it in any of the other passages that I wrote, or not, I didn't write, excuse me, that I read. But we do see it throughout the New Testament. Senior leadership should build the next generation. So, you see Paul. Everywhere Paul goes, practically Timothy's right there with him. When they're not together, it's because Paul sent him to go do something for him over here, or to this church over here. In 1 Timothy 1-2, it opens with, to Timothy, my true child in the faith. So, Paul, as far as we know, didn't have any kids of his own. But Timothy was with him so much, he was like a son to him. He was training Timothy to be a senior leader, to be the senior pastor of a church. In 2 Timothy 1-2, he says it again to Timothy, my beloved child. In Titus 1-4, says to Titus, my true child in common faith, grace and peace from God the Father, and Christ Jesus our Savior. So not only Timothy, but Titus. Paul's raising them, if you will, spiritually, as a spiritual father in the faith, training them to be future senior leaders. 1 Timothy 6, 20 and 21 says, O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. So here at the end of 1 Timothy, Paul is like giving Timothy a, a little bit of advice. Guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble. Grace be with you. So guard what has been entrusted to you. Guard your calling. Guard your faith. Avoid the irreverent mind. It's just another way of building the next generation. Giving them that encouragement. Giving them that wisdom to continue to walk forward in God's will. So are you mentoring the next generation? Are you helping to build and grow your replacement? Or are you leaving that for someone else? So we've looked at a lot of different qualities of leaders that weren't necessarily in the list that Paul put together. But we also see a lot of a lot, a lot, a lot of senior leadership examples throughout the Bible. So I wanted to take a minute and look at some of these people. And when I put it together, it is the person and kind of what they're most known for, if you will. Kind of, a, I guess, what their mission statement would be. So our first example, Abraham. And when you think Abraham, you should think faith beyond measure. Abraham is mentioned a few times throughout the Bible for his faith. Paul gives a big explanation of it in Romans. His faith that God would bring Isaac back from the dead is mentioned in Hebrews 11. That's how much faith he had. God had promised him that he would be the father of many nations, but then asked him to sacrifice his only son. And in Hebrews it said he had so much faith, he knew if he did it, that God would bring him back. Faith-filled leadership will stand on what God has promised and never be shaken. So another example is Noah. And for Noah, it would be Captain the ship. Noah preached repentance and tried to get as many on board as possible 
for 120 years. It took him 120 years to build the ark, and he preached repentance that whole time, just as God asked him. No one turned around. But Noah followed God with the when, the where, the how, the why, all of that. When God said, it's time to board the ship, Noah did. Noah didn't look back. Godly captains will ship, set the ship's speed and direction based on what God tells them. Paul, should all be familiar with Paul, believe in something bigger than yourself. So in Acts 13, 47, it says, for, the, for so the Lord had commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. I think we could all agree with as many books of the Bible as Paul penned. He definitely believed in something bigger than himself. And leadership should have plans from God that they are working on. Something that is bigger than them. That they know I'll never be able to finish this in my lifetime. Which is why I'm bringing up the next generation to continue this work after I'm gone. Nehemiah. Build on what God has given you. And we will see this as we go through the rest of this book. But Nehemiah stewards what God gave him very well. Prudent leadership stewards everything God provides well. And this isn't just money and resources. It's our time, it's our words, it's our knowledge, our wisdom, everything that God gives us. Another example is Barnabas. So Barnabas bridged the gaps of differing opinions. In Acts 4.36, he is named the son of encouragement. He helped bridge gaps between the Greeks and the Jews. So loving leaders should always be looking for ways to help people learn about God and reconcile any differences that they may have. Moses, blind your eyes to petty criticism. Moses was a very patient leader of a people who had very little faith. In Exodus 16, verses 2 and 3, it says, And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that he had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So that's just one example. There are several other examples where it said they grumbled against Moses. But that kind of petty criticism wears on a leader. And a wise leader will work hard to blind their eyes to that and continue to be patient. Not let that petty criticism get to them because then it turns into bitterness, which then turns into anger and unforgiveness, and a lot of really bad things go from there. Elijah, bind together love and courage. Today, we would probably call it tough love. May even call it a tough mind and a tender heart. But whichever you prefer, Elijah loved God, but he also had the courage to say the hard things. In 1 Kings 18.27, he mocked the false god and the false prophets. His sarcasm showed that he had disdain for their false gods and for those who had forsaken the one true God. And there is a time for love and a time for courage. And effective leaders will have the courage to speak when it's unpopular, but they speak the truth with love. David, 
leading with a heart for God. He ruled with a heart for God. And in Acts 13, 22, it says he was a man after God's own heart. And that he would do what God asked. He sought to follow God's will and lead his people with justice and righteousness. So humble leadership seeks God's heart and his will for their life and those that they lead. Joshua, bring the best people to the table. Joshua was considered special by God because in Joshua 5, 13, and 15, God visited Joshua and they had a conversation. Told Joshua the same thing he told Moses, take your sandals off because you're standing on holy ground right here. In Joshua 14, God appointed him with special responsibilities. Again, bringing the best person to the table for the job. Moses also recognized his courage after the spy mission in Numbers 13. So effective leaders will identify the best person for the job and then let them lead in that area. Peter, bounce back after you've been knocked down. Resilience is one of the most important traits of a leader. On your mistakes, Peter denied Jesus three times, but then turned around after Jesus was resurrected and told him that he loved him three times. And Jesus did that to remind him that he had denied him three times. But honest leaders will admit their mistakes and seek to right any wrong that they did. Daniel, be the lighthouse. Daniel defied the laws of King Darius and continued to pray and serve God in Daniel chapter 6. After the lions did, after the Lord spared him and got him out of the lion's den, King Darius declared to everyone, as it said, he sent letters to every nation in the world, that Daniel's God is the one true God. Even in a godless and dark nation, Daniel served God and never doubted. Steadfast leaders will lead everyone they can to God, even in the midst of a lion's den. And finally, the greatest leadership example that I can give, Jesus. Love your flock forever. In John 10, 11, it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. In Luke 22, verses 26 and 27, it says, But not so with you, rather let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. Jesus loves us more than we can ever imagine for all of eternity. He loved us before he, we were even created. But leaders who are striving to be like Jesus will love and serve their flock just like Jesus. Other than Jesus, all the examples were human fully human. None of them were perfect. But we don't have to be perfect to be a part of a senior leadership team. But we should lead by example and as a unified team. Abraham Lincoln once said, whatever you are, be a good one. Whether that's senior leader in a church, whether that's just a head of household leading your family, 
a single young man, single young woman, just trying to make it in this world. Whatever you are, be a good one. And John C. Maxwell once said, a leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. So finally, before I close, I just want to say, this is a three-part mini-series within a series, if you will. So we will be looking more at leadership next week and the week after that. So there may be some things that I didn't necessarily cover this week that we will cover next week. But one thing for sure, um, as I close, the last thing I want to say is don't just sit back and wait. Remember, shepherding is a verb and it's indicating that an action is taking place. Leading and shepherding a church body is an active role. Lead by example. Teach everyone to love and yearn for God's presence and fend off the wolves when they come. Heavenly Father, we come to you again this evening. We just thank you, Lord, for this message that you brought to us. We thank you for being here with us as we studied. And we thank you, Lord, for just opening all of our hearts and minds to what you wanted us to tell, what you told us tonight. And Lord, we ask that you Help us to remember these lessons as we go forward through the next days, weeks, months, and years. And we ask, Lord, that if there's anything that you showed us specifically, that you help us to correct those areas. Help us to be the leader that Jesus was. Help us to be more like him in our leadership roles and just our everyday lives. And Lord, I just want to ask that you be with everybody as they leave here tonight, just watch over them and protect them. Help them to get home safe. And help them to, to get to work and all that safe tomorrow. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.